Hello, I'm Nick Herriman, author of The Entangled State, and welcome to 25 Concepts in Anthropology. Today I'm going to talk about patron-client, the patron-client relationship. What are the characteristics of the patron-client relationship? This is a close, intimate and personal relationship of mutual obligation and reciprocity. So if, for example, you go out for dinner with your boss, who would you expect to pay? You'd expect your boss to pay. And same if it was a teacher or somebody who is older and wealthier than you. And in return for that, uh, the boss would expect you to, for example, laugh at his jokes and so on. And this is like a patient-client relationship. It might be something you can relate to. Uh, as that boss uh, analogy suggests, the relationship is hierarchical in a patron-client relationship. The patron is of a higher status than the client. Typically, patron-client relationships are achieved. There's something you have to work on. It's not something you're just given. You have to become somebody's employee and your boss has to exert such control over you. They can be both long-term and short-term and typically the relationship is shifting and dynamic. Um, if, for example, you're a client and you need, uh, if you're really poor and you go out for dinner with your uh, patron, you might expect him to also give you some extra money or food to help you. Um, and as we'll see, patron-client relationships often piggyback on capitalism. But this is a problematic idea, which I'll discuss more later. So typically the patron has uh, and provides access to greater material capital or social networks. And in return, the client provides labor, support and loyalty. Um, I'm going to give you three examples of this, but I'll just firstly take an example from my own fieldwork. I live with a rich pilgrim and he had a lot of neighbours who did work for him. Some would go to the town and do chores for him, others would go and work in the rice fields, and he would never pay them for this. And at first it seems really unequal and really uh, uh, exploitative, but after a while the true nature of the relationship comes out. When the guy who always works on my pilgrim, uh, host father pilgrim's uh, land, when his child needs to go to school, who has to pay for it? Well, my host father, the pilgrim. So. Um, you do lots of little chores and so on and in the end your patron will pay you back with something big because you don't if you're a client you don't have the access to that kind of stuff okay I'll give you three examples the first is from very close to my field work example uh, Emerson who r writes about Munchar in East Java um, here there were Maduris Madura is an island off northeast Java Maduris had migrated onto the island of Java and they were doing fishing um, in uh, in the bay there and basically there were some cl patrons who owned uh, the boats. Now the clients would borrow a lot of money off these patrons and would there, thereby be indebted to the patrons. In return, the clients are going to work on the patron's boat as fishermen and they work and they work and they work and they kind of repay the debt. Just imagine that they, they borrow $10,000 um, they go fishing for one summer and that's enough for uh, to pay back only a hundred dollars but during that summer they also borrow other money for this and for that now the state government in Banyuwangi in the 1970s decided this was very unequal and the best thing would be um, to pay off these debts for these poor clients um, so that they could start afresh and anew um, firstly the clients didn't want to pay off the debts in other words, they wanted to be indebted because being indebted established a relationship of obligation on for both parties. The patron had to pay for the client, uh, uh, had to give the client work. And so the, the, the clients didn't necessarily want to be free of this. The project failed anyway because they couldn't pay off enough people and in the end the people they chose to take up um, new sh um, fishing boats that were free of patron-client relationships. In the end, they were chosen on the basis of patron-client relationships. In other words, the state attempted to abolish patron-client relationships but couldn't avoid them. Uh, another example comes from the Philippines. Um, this, I don't know too much about this, but typically poorer Filipinos seek out a, re a rich compadrazgo. Sorry, I've spelt that wrong. Compadrazgo, uh, which is basically a, a godparent. Um, so if you are a poor Filipino, what you'll do um, to take care of your child in future life, make sure you get somewhere who's very wealthy, has a lot of access to money and to networks, and make that man become the godparent of your da daughter or son. 
and that way um, your daughter or son can turn to this person later in life as a patron and get that person to be a patron to them as a client. So what, I haven't explained that very well. Basically, the daughter gets baptized and now for the rest of her life she has a godparent, a compadrazgo, who she can turn to and she might, if she's lucky, become the client of this godparent. And we could call the godparent in this relationship the patron. The last example comes from the research of Timur in the Mahakam Delta. Mahakam is in eastern Borneo. I'd suggest you look at that on Google Satellite. It's beautiful. It's um, what you call a distributary. In other words, instead of um, small rivers running to the river mouth, it's the other way around. There's a one large river leading to the river mouth, and then outside the river mouth there are all these um, little islands formed by silt from the river. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's like an explosion from the river mouth. Anyway, Bugis people, who come from another island in Indonesia, colonised this area, particularly in the 1980s and 90s and into the 2000s. And they set up around these little islands shrimp farms. Now, while the Indonesian rupiah was very weak, they made a killing. And they made a lot of money, I should say. But the way they colonised it was through patron-client relationships. In other words, patrons owned a lot of the land and they had clients working for them and paying off debts. And this has kept... Um, I've been I've been stressing the, the positive side of patron-client relationships. Of course, it's unequal. And it's kept a lot of the clients um, perpetually in debt. And now that the, the shrimp industry has collapsed uh, due to various figures, various, um, various factors, the clients are now impoverished. Okay, patron-client relationships relate to two other things. Um, one is patrimonialism. Now, for this idea comes from Weber. Weber said there are three kinds of legi legitimate authority. One is charismatic. Uh, charismatic, for example, is a leadership uh, either of the sword or of inspiration or divine insight. So Jesus was, for example, a person who had charismatic following. He had divine insight, so people followed him and felt he was their leader. Other times, if you follow like the war leader, someone like Genghis Khan, you follow them because of their success with the sword. But what happens when somebody like Jesus or Genghis Khan dies? Um, if their follower doesn't have charisma as well, um, then they'll either resort to patrimonial or patriarchal relationships. Patriarchal relationships would be like there's one new leader and the leadership then passes on to his son and his son and his son. So like if you like kings, um, all powerful kings have patriarchal relationships. Or it turns into patrimonial relationship where instead of one king you have lords, like feudal lords, controlling um, various parts of the land and no one figure is preeminent. So it can be lords or it can be kings, it can be patrimonial or patriarchal. And the last kind of relationship is a rational kind, so the last kind of authority is rationalised authority. And this is typical of modern states where there are laws written on pieces of paper and we follow uh, pieces of paper, basically what's written on pieces of paper because that's thought to be legitimate. So patrimonial relationships are the closest thing we have to patron-client relationships and often patron-client relationships are thought of as patrimonial. The other word is clientelism and clientelism is used more often in politics than in anthropology and it means, quotes, the exchange or brokerage of specific services and resources for political support in the form of votes and is also based on personal relationships. So basically if you're going into politics in the Philippines and you want a lot of votes you get a lot of, you try and um, accrue, you try to collect a lot of clients who will vote for you, but they'll only vote for you if you support them, if you give them, for example, cash or money, and that's clientelism. Okay, this, so the patron-client relationship is quite a powerful way of, of understanding the way people relate to each other, of understanding the bonds between people. And anthropology is all about this, understanding bonds between people. But there are limits to the concept. Um, when we apply it to example with the Philippines or Central and South America in particular, we overlook the fact that it's not always harmonious. We can exaggerate the amount of har harmony. For example, we can get local strong men or bosses actually using violence and murder and intimidation, um, and violence, murder and intimidation to uh, secure followers. So it's not always like the, the followers or the clients go along um, go along with it because it's in their interest. Also, the, on the other side, clients are not always um, victims or passive. Um, 
as Scott points out in his book The Weapons of the Weak, clients use uh, all kinds of techniques to, sh to get out of their responsibilities, if you like. Um, they uh, moan about their, their patron, um, they will drag their feet, work slowly, etc. So that's weapons of the week. But basically, again, the, the patron-client idea is very, under, very useful for understanding human relations, and that's one of the things that interest, that interest anthropologists, how people make ties with other people. And if you like, you can see more of these ideas in my book entitled The Entangled State. So thank you for your attention today, and I look forward to seeing you for more of the 25 concepts in anthropology.